All right. Um, I will go ahead and get us started. Um, our next presentation is going to be the PCC Synopia Cataloging Affinity Group from Pilot to Production Workflows with Synopia. Um, and this will be presented by Joe Serra, Jeremy Nelson, Jim Hahn, TJ Cow, Margarita Perez Martinez, Callie Ma uh, Mathios, Joanna Fuchs, and Michael Lindsay. Um, Joe Serra uh, is from Berkeley Law Library. His title is somewhat mysterious, but he works mostly with the repository, scholarly communications, and everything that those areas touch. Jeremy Nelson is a software engineer at Stanford Libraries. His main research focus is on improving workflows in open source library and bibliographic systems like Folio and Synopia using large language models and other machine learning techniques. Jim Hahn is the head of metadata research at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries, leading linked data and metadata projects and research for the libraries. Jim holds an MS and a CAS in Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois and is a current PhD student in Information Sciences at Illinois. TJ Cow is the head of metadata creation at UC Davis. Before joining UC Davis in September 2019, he worked as a cataloging librarian for numerous libraries, including George Washington University, Claremont College's Library, Yale University, and Multnomah County Library. Margarita Perez Martinez is the metadata and cataloging librarian and institutional repository manager at the University of Miami Law Library. Her area of expertise are her areas of expertise are cataloging and metadata. Callie Mathios is the Linked Data Community Outreach Librarian at Stanford Libraries. She is the Synopia product owner and Blue Core project manager and product owner. She is also one of the co-conveners of the PCC Synopia Cataloging Affinity Group. Joanna Fuchs is the Metadata Coordinator for the Arts and Humanities at Brandeis Library. At Brandeis, her work focuses on enhancing metadata and promoting discoverability of physical and digital collections. She is currently the chair of Boston Library Consortium's Media Community of Interest and has recently been elected to the New England Library Association's Executive Board. Michael Lindsay is a web and software developer at the University of California Berkeley School of Law Library. He works with metadata collections and writes workflows. Uh, whenever you all are ready, uh, feel free to begin. All right, thank you so much, Hollis, for that introduction for the panel today. Um, I am going to be moderating as we get into our roundtable discussion today from the PCC Synopia Cataloging Affinity Group. We're going to put some links in the chat. Margarita has already put a link to the Synopia wiki page, right? So we welcome everyone to take time, you know, whenever to check that out. We also just want to let everyone know that anyone can attend the PCC Synopia Cataloging Affinity Group sessions. These are great ways to do networking, learn about BibFrame, learn about Synopia, and kind of, you know, have some open collaboration between libraries all across not only the country, but the world and where we are with BibFrame. So the PCC Synopia Cataloging Affinity Group you know, provides welcoming and supportive space to learn and discuss cataloging in Synopia using the PCC Synopia templates, cataloging standards, and authority vocabularies. We also, you know, encourage folks too to take time to also visit the Library of Congress Synopia training website. I'm dropping the link right here in the chat. There's a lot of PowerPoint presentations and it's you know, a great resource to have, especially when you're a newbie like myself, learning how to use Synopia and how to implement BibFrame. So today during our roundtable discussion, we are going to look at where various institutions are with Synopia, including testing, pilot, production workflows, and what challenges and opportunities have presented themselves. So to open the discussion, um, we're going to ask, you know, our PCC peeps, you know, where are libraries at in terms of using Synopia now? So I open the floor to begin our discussion. Any takers, where are we at with Synopia? I can, uh, uh, I can, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jim. All right, go ahead, Jim. All right. Oh, well, um, so, so with Penn Libraries, um, we participated in a uh, focus group that Alex Libris had um, hosted. And um, 
within that group, we in the past year we were um, uh, working on integrating uh, data from Sinopia into Alma, and um, you know we built on the ILS middleware that um, Jeremy's team had created a nice framework for, and so building off that, um, we were able to export data into Alma, and now starting in October and uh, going through December, we're doing a pilot in production where we use Sinopia data into our Alma production system and sort of studying. Um, it's, it's a concise pilot in the sense that, you know, it's time bounded and we're kind of studying like all the things that will happen once it's in the ILS, like discovery and um, other like reporting type things that are going to happen with that. So I'll just stop there. <laughs> That's, yeah. No, that's great. That's fantastic. Um, I know I am at an Alma institution and I am a newbie to Bitframe, so that is really exciting to hear. Um, are any other members on this roundtable also implementing the Alma, Sinopia, working together situation? All right, TJ, you want to talk a little bit about your experience? Sure. Uh, is that possible I can share my screen? So I did a very very short slides for people to kind of have some visual thing rather than hearing me talk doing talking head. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Hollis, can Jeremy or TJ share his screen? Uh, great. Yeah, you, yeah, I, think I, <laughs> I was like, I think you should have permission, but. Awesome. Okay, ooh, where's my slide? <laughs> that's kind of funny. Okay, let me find my slides. One second. Oh, here. Awesome. Uh, yeah, you don't, I don't need to see myself. That's great. So, uh, so yeah. So just a few minutes, I'm going to cover some kind of big friends Sinopia implementation at UC Davis. And before I really talk about this, I have to say that at UC Davis, we have been, been really working on the uh, putting big friends into in production since 2013. So finally, this is a year that we are able to put in production. In terms of like implementation milestone, and I'm just going to cover from the uh, same as uh, Jim mentioned, in September 2023, uh, UC Dev joined the Xlibris uh, Link Data Focus Group, and we began to experiment in Sandbox, OMA, and development Sinopia integration. And this is definitely the first step for us to really see that what the workflow is going to look like, right? And this is really uh, uh, largely uh, helped by uh, Jim. Jim did lots of kind of magic in the in the back end, so we are able to make it happen. And in November 2023, we start to experiment with publishing BigFriend data in either BigFriend or Mark 21 format from OMA to OCOC. And this is a part that, of course, locally, we only want to publish BigFriend. We want BigFriend all the way through. However, you know, both Xlibris and OCOC really want to see what it looks like if we have some conversion happening. So as a part of experimenting, we incorporated the uh, Mark 21 format. And for for this specific one, is like we want to publish. It's actually the conversion happening in OMA before you reach to OCOC. So this is the, what happened in November 2023. And since then, we have already kind of sent five batches of uh, different data to OCOC for there to add to for OCOC to add to WorkCat. And in June 2024, uh, the integration switched from sandbox to production. So that really begins our production. And in terms of collection scope, currently we are only focused on two collections. And as you can see on this slide, most of the things are, there are some kind of shared nature, which is electronic resources. Because we believe that electronic resources, well, there are lots of reasons why we only choose electronic resources at this moment. So currently we only uh, put two collections in this production. The first one is local access now a UC Davis ProQuest ETD, because all these kind of resources that are only for UC Davis affiliate users. So this is instruction we got out from our collection strategy. So we think it's okay to put it here and because we don't want to publish them anywhere. So I think the impact in terms of other part of the workflow will be much, much minimal. And then the other collection is the ProQuest eBook Central Chinese books. And for whatever reason, this, the ProQuest eBook Central actually have a significant number of Chinese eBooks published between 20, uh, 2013 and 2015. And lots of records, some of our, I should say, lots of records are already having, a, have already got a work at record in, out there, but those work at records don't have access point or they don't have subject analysis. So they're kind of useless for us. So we, we think it's a great you know, collection to use as a kind of test. And then the next thing is that we are really thinking about using, uh, again, another kind of local 
electronic music collection. So this is our scores that produce a composer uh, kind of under underrepresented. Produce. So none of them is really out there. You could so it's all totally kind of original cataloging. However, in order to move on to the next stage, we really depend on contingent upon the PCC template. And then in the near future, we're thinking about, you know, start with a tangible uh, Romance language resource that require original catalog and some other stuff we're thinking about. And in terms of the challenges, uh, you know, well, well, I can think about like, there are like four little things, four, quite a big thing. The first one is the ongoing and frequent change of the different models and PCC template. And this become a kind of big issue, as you know. So because every time there's a change, we have to change template and then lots of things that need to go along. Yeah. So it's a little bit challenging for us locally. Secondly, it's part of missing links in our work curve and workflow because we still want our data to flow all the way through a speed frame. And doing this experiment, we have to find out that every time you do a conversion, there will be data loss or mistranslation or you know, loss in translation, that kind of situation. So, but currently there's no way we can do the B-frame to B-frame all the way through. So that's become kind of biggest issue. And secondly, that uh, occurring a big uh, UC Davis in, in a consortium with other nine UC campuses. So it becomes a quite an issue that so how, are, how our other UC partners want to deal with this big friend data because it look very different from Mark data, right? And we share the same kind of uh, network zone repository. So it becomes the biggest issue that we still have to try to figure out what to do with it. And in terms of local consideration, of course, training is a big issue. Yeah. And then the other thing is that currently we are very well, we lost two staff member in July. So trying to figure how we're going to move forward become a kind of biggest issue in terms of production. And what's next is that we will continue to work in, uh, continue to work with exhibitors and OCLC to resolve a bunch of the missing links on kind of issue. And also we will start to record some local catalogue decision and creating some documentation. Because currently we actually, uh, we are per I have to confess that most of myself is relying on uh, Library of Congress and MARVA cataloging guideline. So lots of times if I don't, cannot figure something out, I might just steal something from LCs. So yeah, that's something I hope that we'll be able to make some decision and kind of start to create our local documentation. So that's it, thanks. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing, TJ. Have others had similar challenges or different challenges when coming into implementing BibFrame or Synopia at your libraries? I I can say at, at Berkeley Law, um, so we are a UC campus, but the law school has a separate catalog separate ILS and it's it's tin so it doesn't fall into the common tools uh, which has been really fun in a lot of ways because um there's the only friction that exists is created by us um we have approached this as sort of a, a group a small group of people all with very different backgrounds um one cataloger one non-cataloger Michael here and I am sort of the one that throws wrenches in all of the processes. Um, but I, I think, you know, for us, we looked at, we took like a popular reading collection because it is outside of law and more likely to exist else it more generally. Um, and if we mess things up, it won't break the primary resources people are looking for. Um, but a lot of it has been sort of this, these many processes running together of, of both figuring out just what a workflow would look like to get people cataloging in in BibFrame using Synopia and the differences between the cataloger and the non-cataloger. And then um, Michael, I know, has been uh, building sort of a, the proof of concept of can we take Synopia data and plop it into our ILS? And as far as I know, it's been pretty successful so far. Yes, I just, as of yesterday, um, we have using Jim's um, model and example. I'll add our name to all the people who owe Jim quite a debt of gratitude. Um, using that model, um, basically combining the work and instance um, date, bib frame data, and then running it through LC's uh, transform style sheet rules. Um, doing a little bit of um, parsing to uh, convert the resulting Mark XML into the kind of Mark XML that our ILS understands. And then 
either passing it through as a new record or overlaying um, an acquisition record. So we do have a working um, pipeline, um, and but the goal hasn't so much been to like get get cataloging in bib frame so much as to give us uh to in order to, to to make tangible all the pieces um of this for um for librarians who are approaching this stuff new i mean we've got a small staff um we all have our day jobs within our day jobs but we are all interested in um getting our hands on this stuff in such a way that that helps us really have intelligent questions and to move these things forward. And I think we're, we're doing a good job and, and the PCC uh, templates there in Sinopia have certainly been helpful to us. Um, we, we've actually decided to downshift and try to, to step through creating our own templates so that we understand the underlying, um, uh, you know, logic there so that we don't, we're not, so that we're, we're trying to accept as little as possible as a given and, uh, and, and, uh, so that we get our hands on it ourselves and, and get a, a more, um, comprehensive understanding of, of, of the text, but, but it's been going well. I'll, I'll add that I, I assume everybody can agree that having some people who are curious and motivated is, uh, a real bump to getting things done. So um, I don't know if our panelists are, can share, um, you know, for those who might be new to BibFrame or new to understanding Synopia, what are maybe some suggestions or best practices you could offer, you know, catalogers or even libraries to kind of like get that push to move away from Mark into the world of linked data? Well, um, yes. I, well, well, I would say uh, join the PCC Synopia Cataloging Affinity Group, definitely. Um, and also, as you mentioned, the uh, finding the, the training in the Library of Congress. But for me, uh, I also you know, try to participate in conference like this one, like the Link Data uh, Conference or the B-Frame Workshop. Uh, in Europe, I mean, I listened to the uh, to the sessions, and it has been very helpful for me. Thank you, Margarita. Any other suggestions we might have for newbies? I would say join the Slack channel as well, uh, the the PCC Sinopia Cataloging Affinity Group Slack channel. You can ask for help. I would take a look at the PCC templates that were just mentioned for bib frame works and instances. Uh, we have monograph and serial templates you can look at and begin exploring with. And if you have questions, you can reach out to any of us. And I know I would be happy to meet with people one-on-one -on -one if, if it's helpful. We also give workshops um, and I second everything Margarita said about conferences and I think for us too, I like actually digging into it and having things break and not understanding what you're doing so it forces you to read more of the document the various places that it's documented and and i think that you know it's it's a it is a tough read to just go and say i'm going to read all of these things about synopia but if you've just broken something then it gives you like really focused chunks to pay attention to and I could say when Joe's talking about breaking things, he means a local instance of Synopia and not the, the three main Synopia environments. So one exciting thing we're seeing a lot are folks setting up local instances of Synopia and testing things out in an environment that's separate from uh, what most people know as the stage environment, production or development. Um, so just to clarify. <laughs> Right. No, thank you for that. Um, you know, as we move through the discussion, you know, I'm kind of curious to see where our panel members are with where they are in implementing Synopia. Are people piloting? Are they in fully production? And, you know, where are you at in those stages? And maybe like what some challenges you faced with, you know, using Synopia when implementing into your ILS? 
Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna start. Uh, for us at the University of Miami Law Library, we are doing the uh, pilot project because we also are part of the Eclipse Eclipse Lean Data the Eclipse Lean Data Focus Group. And uh, well, the law library is a special library; it's a small library, and there's a small staff too. I am the only cataloger here, metadata cataloger, and uh, and well. Uh, I mean, you know, you know, I, I just, I just believe in BitFrame and the link data, and I'm trying to, to put our, uh, our, our records in production with BitFrame and uh, talking to the main library. Also, the cataloger there is also very, uh, you know, looking forward to we can work together and, and finally uh, jump from the pilot project that we have done uh, to a production environment. And that's very exciting, Margarita. I mean, I think it's exciting to see more libraries go from pilot, getting into the pilot, then getting into production. It, it is very, very exciting to kind of see it move forward. So with those who are, you know, currently using Synopia, whether pilot or production, can you talk about maybe some of the functionality that is really working well right now with Synopia? Takers. Oh, I'll take it. I, I think you, I, I, think, I think the 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 general sort of user interface model of the you know containers within containers um, is being handled as a as about as well as I've seen that idea handled, which is not an easy UI trick to pull off. Um, I know that um, it, it 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 can be it, it can be a little bit of trouble. We've had, I know that there's some uh, ups and downs with the mark conversion um, piece, which is to be expected given where, uh, you know, we are in the in the roadmap of, of Synopia. So I would say um, bring some uh, good humor, good cheer, good juju to the to the site and uh, and reach out about things that you like or don't like. All right, thank you. Um, anybody else want to chime in? Like, what's working well with Synopia? You know, what, what core functionality you think is really doing well right now? Um, or if you want, you know, it's kind of, I'm always curious to see, you know, what enhancements folks would like to see in Synopia. What would you like to kind of see happen in terms as it develops over time? And maybe kind of what functionality, you know, we might be looking for in the world of Synopia and BibFrame. TJ. I'll jump in again. Sorry, can okay. I do? Can I, yeah, I'll, go ahead, Michael, and then TJ. I, I'll be brief. Um, I think that um the that there could there could be more creative thought brought to the locating of resources or templates and navigating through lists. Right now, it feels like a first flush of an implementation which is serviceable but maybe not complete as the universe of those resources and templates grows, there might need to be another um, another stage of, uh, of seeing what could be done to make that easier. All right, thank you for that feedback. TJ, you wanted to chime in? Yeah, well, for me, well, it's probably a little bit because we don't have the capacity like a UC Berkeley law that do lots of local installation or hosting. We totally relied on Exhibers and OCOC. So for us, Probably one of the best thing about Synopia and all my integration is that when we after we create a description in BibFrame, we can push it into OMA and see the realization of the conversion on the flight conversion mark. You can, you know, our catalogs are still very familiar, very good at mark record. So if there's any issue, they can easily identify that hey, where to fix in Synopia. You know, they can go back to Synopia and fix something up. Because during the conversion, you can see certain things are not working or certain things are working better, that kind of stuff. So that's something I found out that this experiment of, you know, the using the integration is actually a great tool for, for us to become more sensitive and more cognizant of the issues that, you know, generally do when we are using Snowpia template. And because I do have to say that, that yeah, I agree to a certain degree, like what Michael said, that it's a little still, sometimes the navigation is a little bit kind of 
lots of clicking, a lot of stroke go up and down. And also sometimes the QA is not working, the, the, but the querying authority is not working. Or some of some of things that um, when you querying authority, so you get the result, but there's no context. So it's really hard to identify which is exactly the, the resource you want to select. So that becomes a kind of a little bit challenging. So that's a part that it turns out we have to find an other way to kind of supplement, you know, for example, you have the easy way is that you just select the one you think is right and then you ex export it, use the OMA integration, export into OMA, and then you see, oh, oops, this is not the one I want. So you go back to Snowflake and fix it. So this is the kind of weird workflow, but it's actually, I think it's also very helpful, you know, if you know whoever catalogs that run into a situation, they can share you know, report issue to Sinopia development. So I think this is a part that you know that's something that um, the Sinopia user can really help the development. But, but otherwise, I think it's in terms of cataloging, I think it's a very good realization of or a present represent a presentation of how the big friend in action. I think that's a part because we I think lots of catalogs are so. We have already heard so well, attended so many training about big friend as a concept, but not really see them in action. So having these tools is actually say, oh, this is what we are talking about in the concept, you know, in the ontology or keep hearing about the model, but how it actually work and how can how we can translate our mark cataloging expertise into Sinopia or, or big friend cataloging. It's, so I think for that, I really appreciate the development of Sinopia, this tool. That's so great to hear, TJ. I think at Stanford, it's really interesting. We're in this unique position of both being the developers and the maintainers of Sinopia and then the users of it and incorporating it into our workflows. And we have just reestablished the connection between Sinopia and Folio. So earlier we were talking about the middleware and its connections to Alma and Jeremy and Jim have done so much work on the middleware and making it possible to see the data moving and to test these workflows and find out maybe what's working well, what needs some adjustments. Um, so I put a link to the middleware in the chat. And I don't know, Jeremy, if you want to say anything about um, the recent folio work or the middleware in general. Well, uh, so the, the middleware uses a, a widely used open source platform for workflow management called uh, Airflow. Uh, and it's sponsored by the Apache Foundation. Um, we have, have have gone through some iterations and improving it. Um, some of the initial design decisions that, that we implemented uh, where every single group would, would, would trigger a, a, a message into a separate message queue turned out to be not scalable uh, when all the Alma libraries and the pilot joined. So we did some refactoring there uh, to use a single queue and then just uh, basically every time a particular uh, library wanted to export their resources, then it would just uh, basically run a, a workflow for that particular uh, institution. Um, uh, I would say that uh, Callie and I are working on a process or and sort of troubleshooting it so that we can easily add new libraries who are interested in doing the, this export. Uh, right now, I think we're kind of constrained to just Alma and Folio libraries. Um, we have in the past supported uh, Symphony, um, but um, if, an, if a, a library has that, we could probably resurrect some of that code and, and try to figure it out. But right now, um, we're, we're primarily supporting Alma and, and Fuller libraries. I'm curious if Callie or Jeremy, you could talk about maybe some challenges that, or opportunities that have presented themselves, you know, with Synopia and the you know, working with Folio. I you know like Elsie has had some presentations about moving towards Folio and BibFrame. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, what maybe opportunities and challenges you've faced at Stanford? I have been really excited about the new, uh, I call it a reestablished connection, but it could be considered new because the previous connection to the ILS was Symphony and now we're working with Folio. And mapping to the inventory instance in Folio seeing the entire process, you know, creating a description or working with an established description in Synopia and then sending it from Synopia. It goes through the middleware, airflow, magic, <laughs> and then is in Folio. Uh, 
and then is also showing up in our search for test instance without any mark conversion whatsoever was really exciting for me. Um, and TJ talked about how there can be different data considerations when you're moving between bib frame and mark a lot and, and what happens to the data in that process. So it was the first time I had a hands-on experience where I had a description in bib frame and it moved into Bolio instance, which is like a JSON format, but you're not needing to convert to mark for discovery or go back to mark for a different use of the data. And that's not to say that might not happen later, but um, to me, that was that was a highlight. I don't know, Jeremy, if you would agree or have a different opinion. <laughs> no, no, I, I totally, totally. Um, I, I, so in our folio implementation in particular, we're basically constructing a, a local uh, RDF graph of the bib frame instance and work, and then running a series of Sparkle queries to extract the data we want for the folio instance. And I, I think that's like one of the first times we've actually used some of the capabilities of, of linked data and RDF uh, as, as part of like a production workflow. So um, that's sort of exciting. And it, it made it, uh, I think, easier to, to, to reason about. Um, we weren't going from, you know, bid frame to mark and then extracting information from the mark to, to, to go into, you know, your ILS or whatever. So to me, that that was an exciting, or is an exciting sort of functionality. And then if we, when we want to add additional data elements into the, the folio records, we can just really just add a Sparkle query to do that and, and set it up and then we can rerun it. So. Yeah, and that's pretty much where we are today is we have this base set of data that migrates over or links over, and then we're adding additional uh, fields, mapping additional fields, and then we'll start looking at different formats as well. So a good, good base for starting with. No, thank you for sharing. That's exciting to kind of think like there's no conversion of mark or like you have to go in, look at a mark, try to then translate it back into BibFrame and then you know, the whole going back and forth between different, you know, standards. That's exciting to hear. Um, for those who have used Sinopia with, you know, Alma or Ex Libris products, you know, maybe what some opportunities have you guys discovered working with like Alma or Ex Libris ILS systems and Sinopia slash BibFrame? Going once, going twice. <laughs> Well, well, there's um, I think there's two two like paths you can. I mean, you can use Primo, and then um, you know, Primo will have um the display capabilities, and they've implemented like author cards um and, and various things there that you know can build off the linked data that's um in the description. We have uh, Blacklight though. Um, so that's the other. That's uh, number two is you could either use you know Primo or you could do your own discovery. So so we have Blacklight instead of Primo at Penn. And we're just now experimenting with uh, the indexing. But uh, um, yeah, I, I think um, I think we can do where so we're it's still early days for that. So we're trying to figure out exactly what that'll be like. But I think we can um, implement like, um, you know, improved uh, author disambiguation with some of this data in terms of like author cards and works and, and stuff like that. But I, I know, I think like uh, Emery is in that situation too, but I think um, a lot of a lot of people use like actually Rus Alma also use Primo. So I think that's um, that's out of the box basically. Awesome, thanks for sharing, Jim. Um, I just wanna be mindful of time, we're at 2.36. So, you know, I encourage all of our attendees if they have any questions for our panelists to go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, you know, feel free to ask anything, range from bib frame to Sinopia to, you know, integration with ILSs. Um, you know, I'm kind of curious too with our panelists, um, you know, I know we had talked about some of like the stuff we can do, like the PCC group and everything, but um, you know, how do you really encourage your colleagues then to kind of like get out of that mold of Mart 21 and into this world of bib frame? I know um here on the East Coast, I've had, you know, discussions with people, like they love the theory behind it, but they're just not ready to take that leap to get out of Mart 21 into bib frame. So maybe what 
you know, suggestions you might have at a local level at your own institution to kind of encourage people to, to branch out into this new way of cataloging? Well, I would say, you know, my jump wasn't from Mark 21 to Bibframe, super clear cut. I spent a lot of time experimenting in Wikidata before I looked at Bibframe. I think it's a really great place to learn about RDF and triples and how linked data works in an open and free environment. So I would recommend starting there. There are also a lot of great workshops in, on Wikidata and there's the Wikidata Affinity Group, which was my first experience with linked data. And it was such a welcoming community full of people who have been doing it a long time and those who have just started. And maybe consider it as a fun learning experience to start and not um, not a mandate that's over your head that you better learn this and it's what's happening next. Just dip a toe in and see how it feels and ask questions um, because there's lots of us here who have felt intimidated by getting started and end up thinking, oh, this is so fun. I want to keep doing it. I was doing Wikidata, you know, in 2020 after work hours because I enjoyed it so much. So um, that's just my two cents. Right. Thank you, Callie. And we do have a question. Um, Michael, do you want to chime in real quick? Yeah, I just I, I, what I would I'm trying to keep in mind is that I want um, I want our catalogers who are of of, uh, of, of a, have more of a mark background to uh, make sure that any messaging I'm doing doesn't make anyone feel like a, a retrograde that they're part of uh, that that they're dragging their feet or the new way is shiny and great and you're old. There's some problem back here. I mean, we may have our various private opinions about things like that, but I want to make sure that our uh, our our staff feels like their expertise is is respected no matter where they are along that spectrum and, and instead focus on making the case for, for linked data as just an exciting um, opportunity for libraries to leapfrog, you know, my two cents. No, that is great feedback. So thank you both. Um, I'm just going to read the question just so our panelists can hear it. Um, Sean King asked, how is Stanford reconciling slash publishing records to OCLC? And Callie put in the chat um, that Stanford production workflows with OCLC don't overlap with Snopey experiments yet. Um, does Stanford thinking about maybe in the future having that overlap with OCLC or is that something not on your roadmap? Um, it's not really something we're thinking about right now. And Nancy's here and can definitely elaborate on that. Thanks, Nancy. <laughs> so what Callie's trying to avoid to say, but I'm going to say it anyways, is, um, you know, we just in the past year moved, um, from Symphony to Folio and our, um, our, even our mark, oh, sorry, my video just doesn't work. Um, our, our, um, even our MARC records aren't fully going to OCLC yet. So um, sending BibFrame to OCLC <laughs> would be very much a next step at this time. Um, we have sent uh, records to OCLC in the past, um, BibFrame descriptions to OCLC in the past, and they have ingested them successfully in their test database. I can tell us that, but we haven't put together a workflow of any type yet. All right. No, thank you, Nancy. Um, maybe just a general question, too, in terms of, you know, a lot of libraries rely on WorldCat for, you know, resource sharing and interlibrary loans. So if we're at Stanford, um, are you guys using like Rapido or something else then to make sure that your bid frame records are being discoverable by other libraries? Okay. I'm sorry, this is completely out of my. That's area. totally fine. It was just we do not really at this time since we just moved back to Folio have actual bib frame in production records. So okay, nope, that is a valid answer. Is just like I you know um here a lot. I'm of not really sure what Rapido is. So oh, much. it's an Xlibris product that does resource sharing for, you know, interlibrary loan requests, um, you know, versus Iliad. There's a bunch of like other products out there that promote, you know, resource 
you know, sharing between academic libraries and public libraries. So um, Stanford kind of works with POD, which is an IPLC, the Ivy's Plus groups, um, to do ILL and OCLC. So all right. Yeah. Good to know. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we got a few minutes left. Um, I don't know if our panelists want to have any comments here in the last few minutes or if there's any other questions from attendees that they would like to ask from the panel here today. I, if I can add to the discussion of encouraging people, how to encourage people to look at BibFrame, um, regardless of their stance on Mark, I, I think that for me, again, not as a cataloger, part of the benefit of it is not simply thinking this is the next system, I need to learn it, but it's thinking like <clears throat> other people look at data in a different way and all it really is is looking at your data in a different way. In the end, the display is what's going to matter to the person who's looking at it and the displays will change based on the on the audience. And I know that you know catalogers see displays very differently than end users do. And so in, in a lot of ways, I think approaching BibFrame as as the this is just a different way of looking at library data, I think makes you ask a lot of questions both ways about what's useful um, or just what's an interesting quirk and why that exists. Thank you so much, Joe, for that. I think that's a really good point. Um, we do have a quick question um, from Timothy. I'm curious if the panelists have thoughts about how a full conversion of the catalog might go or maintenance slash conversion of legacy slash minimal catalog records. That is a really good question. <laughs> I know a lot of, I mean, even my catalog, we have very old records with minimal metadata and trying to, you know, we convert that even now. Callie, you have a thought? Yep, I'm going to start it, and then I think Jim is going to piggyback, hopefully. Um, I immediately thought of ShareVDE. Um, there's a lot of data there that's been converted um, and is discoverable. And uh, that that I was just going to say that much. I don't know, Jim, do you want to add on that? I know Penn has done so much with Share. I mean, I think um, I, I actually wasn't. Oh, thank you for that, because I, I hadn't thought of that. I mean, Share, you know, ShareVD is a is an example it's one way that people are able to like see bib frame outside of theory and more more in practice but um what i was going to put a plug in for is um you know maybe maybe taking a step back from this question and just um suggesting like we take a look at the library of congress standards support that includes the crosswalks and i feel like because lc is doing uh such good work you know keeping those up to date as a standard evolves, like, you know, you can have some set of things as bid frame and then also like, um, you know, on the fly, see it as Mark. Um, it's not perfect, but I would, I think those transformation tools are really valuable. I'll drop some links in. All right, thank you so much, Jim and Kelly. Uh, Nancy, you have your hand raised? Yeah, I was just thinking of the legacy data. Uh, legacy data aspect um i have to say um the library of congress also has a lot of legacy data and their conversion tables from mark to bitframe actually include much a lot of legacy data fields that are no longer used generally by catalogers but actually have various um do have mapping into bitframe um i just wanted to add uh to put a little boost i put it in the um, chat earlier on that um the program for cooperative cataloging does also have a, a, a training module on synopia that's available at the uh the uh in the training portal um the catalogers learning workshop um it's like nine modules on cataloging in in synopia so that's also take worth taking a look at Awesome. Thank you so much, Nancy. So we well, are I think it's also actually linked from the Synopia help as well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you again for like reminding us. Um, so we are at time. Um, let's be mindful of people's time. Um, I do want to thank everyone for attending today. I want to thank our panelists for their insightful input, suggestions, 
and wisdom in Sinopia and Bibframe. Um, feel free, again, to put anything in the Slack. Again, if you see anything on the listserv, feel free to jump on to any of our PCC, you know, workshops, especially at the Sinopia Affinity Group. Everybody is welcome. It's a great way to collaborate. Check out some of the links. Um, I know they will be posted in the Slack channel. And I hope everyone enjoyed today's discussion. And it was great to meet you all. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to any of us. So I want to thank those who organized this year's LD4 conference and allowing us to have time today to talk about Sinopia and where we are with Sinopia.